Bridget Wiseman is one W-2 success story. Pamela Mims is another. Their story is a bit later. Both are part of Wisconsin Works. The program, Governor Tommy Thompson said, marked the end of the automatic welfare check in the state. Linda Stewart's agency oversees the Wisconsin Works program. Our purpose with W-2 was twofold. One, it was to eliminate the old AFDC system, which really kept people in poverty too often, generation after generation, with really no hope for the future. And the second was to help people get meaningful employment, um, good skills, and an opportunity to get to self-sufficiency. Well, there are 80 W-2 agencies in Wisconsin, consisting of a mix of private, tribal, and county government agencies. In Milwaukee County, there are five W-2 agencies. The YWCA is one of them. Well, the YWCA has been in the city of Milwaukee for 108 years and always doing programs for women uh, and jobs types programs. So because we believe in um, work and people empowering themselves through work is that the W-2 program would be a good program for us to help continue our mission of helping women. An individual that would decide to come to YW Works, they would start at uh, our customer service area where they would see a resource specialist who would help them um, kind of figure out where they're at in life. They go over their housing, their child care, all kinds of issues in their life to see if there are any barriers there that would prevent them from moving forward and try to work it out there. Um, if in fact the person needs some help, they would move forward into the system. Their first stop would be our pre-academy, which has been a very successful program for us. It's four hours a day uh, for one week. In the pre-academy, the person learns about W-2. We really want to get them going. You know, as I said, take advantage of us. It explains the programs we have. It explains uh, what, what it means to take W-2. There's a five-year federal limit on it. You know, you have two years in any given tier on the ladder. So, you know, we try to start right then for the individual to take responsibility for their decisions. You know, if you decide to take this now, you're burning that clock. Is this the right decision at this time, or should you not? Um, those kind of things in the pre-academy. We also do assessment there, so we know where an individual is on their, employ employ and the, on their skills for employability as well as um, on, uh, where they are on academically on math and reading levels. Then they would go into the Academy of Excellence, which is a two-week motivational, and it has a component called Survival Skills for Women. And in that, people learn budgeting, they learn um, stress management, they learn um, job, um, how to interview jobs, how to do um, nutrition for your family, all those things that you need to put together in your life to survive. <laughs> And, and to survive working. Um, and, and along with empowerment courses, it's a very highly motivated um, two weeks. Um, an individual is in there eight hours a day for two weeks. After that, they go to probably creative workshop, which is, you can see going on around us. Uh, at the creative workshop, it is basically another site for assessment. We really are working with employers on setting up standard skills that they need in the workplace. And here is where we assess those. Some of those standard skills that we know all employers are looking for is communication, teamwork, um, you know, the soft skills of showing up every day on time, those kind of things. We can evaluate those standard skills here, and we're really focusing on that to carry that out through, through the whole, all the programs an individual works on here are standard skills that employers need and want. Um, and from there, we also have Generation 2 Plastics, an individual might um, go there for training in injection molding, light industrial, um, we could certify them for forklift, those kind of things. So it's another training center of ours to move individuals forward. Bridget Wiseman got into W-2 while working part-time in the private sector. She now works full-time as a trainer in the YW Works Creative Workshop. Handmade clothing and accessories are made here under the name Circle of Women and sold in more than 50 boutiques in the Midwest. I wasn't going to be on W-2 long regardless if the Y hadn't hired me or somebody else was going to hire me because I was job netting everywhere. I was networking everywhere. So this was just right here. I got comfortable uh, doing what I was doing. I found myself mentoring to the ladies here. Um, found a lot of ladies that came in with crisis, and I was a big help to them. And I kind of, like, changed their whole attitudes. 
about the program and hey, this program is offering you this. You can get your high school diploma, you can get your GED, you can do a lot of things now. Take this opportunity while, while it's there. And now, uh, the ladies that are coming into the program now, they're coming into it, like I said, they have a goal. There are things that they want to do. In addition to helping participants find work, the YWCA also provides a number of support services. Um, some of our support grant programs would be child care, transportation, uh, child care transportation where um, we have a program where your child is picked up in the morning, taken to the daycare, uh, and picked up and delivered at home at night to make it more convenient for the parent. Um, so we have um, child care transportation, we help people with bus passes, we have job access loans that might help you get a car repair, get a car, or things like that to, so you can get to and from work. Uh, we also have counseling services, uh, kind of similar to an EAP program, where if um, having some difficulty in life that they really need to see a counselor, they can schedule to see a counselor to help them work through issues. Um, we have our job center, which we've just expanded, and we're very proud of it. It'll be, I, I hope, a very well-used job center in the community. Um, people could come in there and work on their resume, um, work on looking for other jobs to advance because many people go into entry-level jobs and we want to see that they continue their career so they can get career counseling and help in that. I guess one thing that I find disappointing is many people um, don't take advantage of the programs and I think that's probably the saddest thing um, that, that we have to deal with. As mentioned, the YWCA is one of five Milwaukee County agencies that provide W-2 services. The others are Employment Solutions, United Migrant Opportunity Services, Maximus, and the Opportunities Industrialization Center. And OIC was founded in the early 60s, Reverend Leon H. Sullivan, based on the principle of self-help. And our mission, our model, helping people to help themselves, so that's what OIC is. And we knew the way to do that was through comprehensive job training, uh, education, and then eventually getting a job and becoming self-sufficient. And, uh, and a lot of people said, how did OIC get involved with W-2? Well, from the time it was inception of our beginning, it was to help people help themselves. And W-2 was exactly fit into that philosophy of OIC. People need a lot of support because it's kind of hard to expect people to come in and do some of these things that we're asking them to do and they got other barriers. So we deal with the AOTA. Um, we have services for domestic violence, rental assistance. A lot of people are facing evictions, clothing. In fact, we just purchased the facility. We're going to have our own transitional housing, temporary, someplace where they can stay until they can get into permanent housing. So we have our own support services building. And then there, there's food pantry, clothing bank. And then if they need any other advocacy services, legal or social, we have other places that we can refer them to. The Children's Outing Association is the job site for one of OIC's W-2 participants. Pamela Mims was working here as a receptionist, but was about to begin a job as a certified nursing assistant. Pamela says she found additional learning opportunities through W-2. They wanted me to do a lot of different things. And I did what they asked me to do, you know, to get initiated with the W-2 program. I was going to um, the GED preparation classes at OIC, and um, one of the and as it went on, one of the instructors, you know, asked me would I be interested in a life force program, which was mer uh, branched off and merged with directly with MATC. And I learned a lot. I met a lot of people. I met a lot of people, a lot of very influential people that could help down the line, you know. Um, even at, at, at OIC as well, I came in contact with a lot of positive people. And I think that makes the difference, the type of people that you come in contact with and the, and the response that you get. Originally, uh, back in September of 97, during the conversion period, uh, there was a heavy emphasis on employment, employment, uh, and there were many people who came to us during that time who were job ready, who uh, had recently been laid off and those types of things, or who were underemployed. And we were able to put them into, or to help uh, prepare them 
uh, for a position that is paying a higher wage. Um, however, as we moved into the population and, and to the point where we are now, we have encountered uh, or we have begun to encounter people who have multiple barriers, AOTA, domestic violence issues, uh, uh, and some of which they've been able to conceal and hide and maintain a, a lower level of employment because there were less expectations uh, by the employer. One of our programs within OIC is uh, Keys to Life Academy. Um, pretty much all of the job seekers who come to OIC are assigned to the Keys to Life Academy. That's where the assessment occurs and we can pretty much determine where this person is, psychologically, educationally, you know, <clears throat> everything, so that we know how to customize our service to meet that individual person's needs. Uh, that's where the motivational activities occur, and so they can just, you know, I mean, the first part of it, before we even get into the meat and potatoes of the program, is to help you to feel good about yourself, you know, and to recognize that we are here to really help you. I mean, it's just not the W-2 monster that we really, we want you to be successful. Gypsy moths don't belong in Milwaukee or anywhere in North America. French scientist E. Leopold Trouvelot brought them from Europe in 1869, hoping to breed a hardier silkworm. Unfortunately, a few escaped in Boston, and since then, the gypsy moth has spread west and south, defoliating hundreds of thousands of acres of forests and woodlands. Early in May, I visited Milwaukee County's Wilson Park to check on the problem here. When the magnolia petals start dropping from their flowers, that's when the gypsy moths begin to hatch. And uh, they're dropping petals are dropping and the moths are hatching. And of course, they're hatching just at the right time because you can see that we just have uh, leaves emerging from the trees. You can see uh, here's some gypsy moth egg masses. And you can see some tiny little black flecks. The longer lines that are maybe a quarter inch are gyp gypsy moth caterpillars. And there could be from anywhere from 100 to maybe five, 600 uh, eggs in an egg mass. And then they'll migrate through the treetops. You can see some old pupae, the reddish brown elliptical shells from last summer when the, the caterpillars pupated before the adults emerge sometime late July. Why are officials so worried about this insect? Milwaukee is proud of what's been called its urban canopy, some 200,000 trees growing along its streets and boulevards. County parks and homes contain many thousands more. Gypsy moth caterpillars thrive in many habitats because they are not picky eaters. Being non-native, they have few natural enemies. Most travel with our help. One of the principal ways that the gypsy moth spreads beyond its already infective range is, is uh, from people. They travel on cars and campers and in their, uh, under wheel wells and bumpers. And uh, We have a lot of picnics and big little league activity. There's a lot of people here. Uh, and then this is a, exactly what a gypsy moth would like. A lot of oak trees, a lot of basswoods. Uh, good environment for them also. In Wisconsin, the gypsy moth is mostly confined to counties close to Lake Michigan. The red indicating counties generally, though not heavily, infested. The yellow counties where the moth has been found. What are we doing about it? Wilson Park has seen the heaviest infestations in Milwaukee County, although it has been discovered elsewhere in the area. Controls included a spraying of egg masses last fall with soybean oil to suffocate them. That has had some success in the park. The DNR has provided containers with the eggs of a parasitic wasp, which will lay its eggs on the caterpillars. What does the orange indicate? Uh, the orange ribbons, we marked the trees where we sprinkled last fall uh, a fungus provided to us by the DNR that will be a parasite, a parasite on the, uh, the caterpillars. 
What could happen to a woods like this with this kind of infestation if it wasn't controlled? If it wasn't controlled, it would defoliate the entire woods. So the next step to slow the spread in mid-May was to spray the infested trees. Officials say the bacterial spray is harmful only to the young caterpillars, killing them while they feed on the leaves. In the county, Milwaukee County Parks, this is the first uh, controlled spray that we're using for gypsy moth. So in a sense, we're fortunate. You know, they've been monitoring these populations for basically the last 15 years. This is the first real hot spot that we've got that uh, really warrants some control or we're going to have, you know, defoliation and tree loss. I'm sure we would have had in uh, this east end of the park, we would have probably had uh, complete defoliation of all these older oaks and uh, many of which I don't think would have the capability to relieve. The spread of the gypsy moth is attributed to the natural movement of windborne larvae, an accidental movement by humans. Female gypsy moths are not capable of flight, laying their eggs where they emerged. If you find a, a, a pure white moth that looks fat, you pick it up and you drop it, you know, it's not going to fly away. If it flops to the ground, you know you have a gypsy moth. The males are, are more indistinct. They're slightly smaller and uh, tannish brown. For more information, you can call the Gypsy Moth Hotline at 1-800-642-MOTH. Spraying operations took place this spring in 18 counties where the concentration is the greatest. Officials say every dollar spent to slow the spread saves two to eight dollars in cost to homeowners, businesses, and government, but they know they can't get to all of them. They're hidden under the bark and in the very tops of the trees. Um, so we know that there's going to be some that got away. Uh, we, one or two egg masses survived, you know, that could be a thousand more caterpillars, a thousand more moth moths. And hopefully that'll reduce the population. Uh, so take, take it away from epidemic proportions. And then we'll go through the same monitoring process again. Uh, uh, this fall. It's a nice place. I hate to see the character of the woods, you know, diminished and, and some of these trees are probably 200 years old or nearly so. It's a lot of years of growth and uh, to just throw out the window. And, uh, we'll do what we can to uh, protect them. Thousands of people flock to the beaches of Lake Michigan during the hot and hazy days of summer. Many take a dip in its cool waters without any concern about waterborne diseases. They can feel comfortable because of the watchful eye of the Milwaukee Health Department. The Health Department for decades has da performed daily monitoring on the three city of Milwaukee beaches, Bradford, McKinley, and South Shore. But in 1998, the city applied for an MPACT grant from the Environmental Protection Agency. MPACT stands for Environmental Monitoring for Public Access and Community Tracking. And this grant is basically to enhance the current monitoring program. This year at South Shore Beach and a beach in Racine, new automated environmental monitoring equipment has been installed. Some floats beneath an orange buoy a few feet from the shore. Other equipment sits on a pole nearby, including a television monitor connected to a water quality website. The city health department is um, the lead on this, and then we're working with them on putting the instrumentation into the two beaches, and then the U.S. Geological Survey is helping with collecting the data on their database and putting it back onto the uh, city's webpage. Those are the three major players. We have to put out the equipment in the spring um, so it can monitor the water quality at the beach area. Um, and so the, the sensor will be in the water where the orange float was. Um, and then the signal is brought in on a cable under, on the bottom of the beach, up underground to a pole, which you had a picture of, uh, where the data is collected there. And then by a phone link, it's um, picked up by the U.S. Geological Survey. The equipment will allow the health department to do two things 
to display some real-time water quality and air quality information to the public via our project website and also allow the health department um, with our partner MMSD, Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District, to analyze that data to improve a health risk predictive model that we currently have. Analysis of water samples still requires the traditional 24-hour lab tests. A more rapid test is being developed, but in the meantime, the environmental data can indicate problems. What we are monitoring for with the equipment are um, water quality parameters like pH, conductivity, turbidity, gets a little technical, <laughs> uh, water temperature, um, and these things may correlate well with our bacteria data so that we can incorporate them in a model that would allow us to have an idea of the health, health risk at the beach more quickly than laborate, laboratory tests uh, currently what, allow for. They may miss events just because the way the events will happen, maybe it'll be late at night, a pulse will come through, and we need a nice continuous record, um, especially of temperature and uh, fluorescence and turbidity, which they're not always measuring that frequently, which will be maybe good indicators of the um, pollutants that are coming through the area. Also um, have signs at the beaches. Um, we just reached an agreement with the county to have signs um, with information that not only includes our, our um, water quality advisory, but also some causes of pollution, possible causes, and some things people can do to reduce water pollution. Um, these signs will be posted on all of the lifeguard stands. Poor water quality at the beaches is primarily an indirect result of heavy rainfall. That's not usually a serious or frequent problem at Bradford and McKinley beaches, but it can be at South Shore. We believe this is because of really its, its position relative to the river confluence that flows into Lake Michigan and then we have a uh, southerly current um, towards to the south towards the beach. Um, there's also a break wall um, which may decrease the dilution effect. The grant that pays for the special monitoring equipment is scheduled to end this year but those interested in the water quality of our beaches and the health of those who use them say the partnerships will continue. In the meantime, you can check the website or call the City of Milwaukee Health Department for additional information. And when the warm weather comes, check for and follow any health advisories. The lakefront is a wonderful asset to the city and we encourage people to um, go to the beach and use the lakefront, but to please um, be aware of our advisories and um, you know, act accordingly.